I've been southbound, I've been hellbound, riding on the midnight train. Going too fast now, think I'll slow down, standing in the pouring rain. What's going on, guys? Tony and Tristan here with the One Hell of a Life Outdoor Podcast Show. And you all, we have got a huge guest on today. Um, you know, our most important partner in what we do is no doubt about it, Frog Togs. I mean, they keep us dry, they keep us warm. Um, and we are so privileged today to have Mr. Will Fowler, the CEO of Frog Togs. Will? Thank you, Will. We're excited uh, yeah. to have you on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be with us. Oh, hey, fellas. It's it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, sir. So, um, you know, so we're going to dive right into the stuff, you guys. Just a quick overview of what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to find out a little bit about Mr. Fowler, and we're going to talk about some of these incredible products that we use and and some of the great innovation and, and, and wonderful things that they do over at Frog Talk so you guys can be intimate with understanding who they are. And, uh, you know, I think the best way to start this is, if you don't mind, uh, Will, would you just tell everybody a little bit about yourself and kind of what got you into the outdoors? Sure, yeah. So, you know, I, I was born and raised right here in North Alabama. Actually, I grew up on a, a row crop and cow-calf operation farm about 10 miles south of where I'm sitting right now talking to you guys. Um, it was a farm that my grandfather bought when he came back from World War II um, and, and resettled in the area. Um, my children are the fifth generation of our family to live in this area and, and this town of Arab in particular. So we're pretty proud of that fact, but, uh, yeah, I grew up on a farm and, you know, it was, uh, it was rare to eat a store-bought egg until we moved to town when I was 15. So we had chickens and we had pigs. We had the last smokehouse in the community on our place. So when I was a very young a boy, we still had neighbors coming over and killing hogs in the winter and, and hanging their, their pork in our smokehouse Wow! Um, because it was the last one in the community. So wow. um, we weren't subsistence farmers, but we did a lot of subsistence farming. Um, you know, we canned a lot of fruits and vegetables. We had orchards. Of course, we had cattle, but we didn't butcher those, the hogs we did. So I, I grew up on a farm and we had a catfish pond and you know, that was some of my fondest memories is when it was time to salt catfish. We'd go catch catfish and and uh, skin them, fillet them, and put them in a salt barrel, you know, and eat them fresh sometimes. So just growing up on a farm, you were kind of immersed in that outdoor lifestyle. And the biggest tradition we had was during quail season, my uncle and my father would hunt at least three days a week during quail season, just on the coveys we had on our farm at the time. And on 180 acres, sometimes there'd be 17, 18 coveys. That's how wow. dense the population was when I was a kid. And now you, you hardly ever see one anymore. Mm. Um, but that's a different story, you know. But, yeah, so they would do that. And then on uh, New Year's Eve, we'd have a big quail supper, you know, fried quail, mashed potatoes, peas, gravy, biscuits, all the all the stuff from from – harvest throughout the year and the quail that sort of thing and you know our catfish pond was pretty big and and most winters occasionally you'd have a couple of teal or maybe a couple of gadwall come sit on it if you were sneaky enough you could call yourself a duck hunter for a couple of days every winter <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that is awesome wow man so you know i can't help but you know before we dive further into this is to talk about y'all how I first became familiar with Frog Togs, the brand, you know, and um, I won't forget, I was, I was uh, bass fishing with a buddy of mine and we were just, you know, your average fisherman out there, you know, fishing public land or farm ponds, whatever. And, uh, you know, the only way to protect yourself from the rain was a garbage bag or a poncho. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, a plastic, hot, sweaty thing. And, and one of my buddies one day, he, he came and he had this, had a nice real tree pattern on it, you know, and he goes, what you need to do is get one of these frog togs jackets. And I said, what the hell's a frog tog jacket? I go, what is that? And he goes, dude, it's breathable. It keeps me dry. I'm like, get out, you know? So then we, we was actually in a rainstorm and I still had not bought one. And Dave pops his out and throws his on and just looks at me and smiles, you know, and, and doggone next day I was at the store. I was getting me a frog dog's jacket, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's whenever I, that first happened, that had to be like, um, uh, 98, 99, somewhere in there, I'm guessing. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, 
just to fast forward, you know, when we got into waterfowl hunting, you know, I was just familiar with the brand and I knew they had an incredible fishing uh, line of products. And, uh, um, I thought, well, I wonder if they carry waterfowl waders, you know, and sure enough they do. So I went right to the store and bought me some, you know, and we haven't looked back since. So, yeah. And it was a big deal, um, for us starting duck hunting in Florida, you know, we're originally from Illinois, but funny enough, started duck hunting in Florida and, uh, you know how hot it is in the South and to have something breathable, you know, from starting with neoprene waders, it was like, oh my gosh, like these are heaven's <laughs> like, Oh, I mean, we were calling everybody that we knew and just like, look, you are a complete idiot if you don't go buy a pair of these waders. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a game changer. We were out there hunting teal and, you know, the heat index was well over 90 and that's by nine o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. and no wind and our buddies in the in the neoprene, even our cameraman, he was just like dying, dying. We're over there going, "Hell yeah, we're doing all right." <laughs> That's right. So, but uh, but anyway, I, I just think it's, it's important just to um, for y'all to understand the you know I was a consumer. Mm-hmm. Uh, even before that and that's what made me a believer and that's why it makes it so easy for us to talk about the frog dogs products but nobody knows it better than mr fowler so you know will can you kind of just dive into you know how did frog dogs get started yeah so i mean that that kind of ties in you know you asked my background outdoors um i went to the university of alabama when i graduated from my high school and uh decided that the hunting and fishing down there was a lot more attractive than the classwork was <laughs> and, uh, about halfway through my career down there they said you know we don't really like your grades we think you ought to go home and, and think about this for a minute <laughs> for you and my father being an ex-army ranger and and the businessman that he was ordered a couple loads of cross ties to be left at the farm and told me to start building a cross tie fence and so I spent that summer doing that, and when it came time to go back to school, they said I could come back, and he gave me the option. He said, well, you can stay here and work on the farm for $6 an hour, and I'll make sure you got plenty of work to do, or you can go back to school, but I'm done paying for it, so you're going to have to get a job and do it yourself. So I said, well, based on what I know at this moment, I want to go back to school. <laughs> I don't really care what I have to do to make that work. So I went and, and asked for a job at an outdoor store called Woods and Water in Northport, Alabama, that was owned by Tony and Emma Laws. And they were gracious enough to provide me with uh, employment. And I learned a great deal about outdoor products, merchandising, sales, distributorship, sales reps, which Tony had been before he opened his own store, Um, you know, retail, uh, the customer experience and, and, you know, basically organization, ordering product, that sort of thing. So I would say most of my education that I use today came from my my two and a half years working for Tony and Emmett Woods and Water, uh, more so than it did from the University of Alabama. But once I applied myself, I I did take quite a bit away from the, the, uh, uh, business school at Alabama and, and appreciate, you know, um, then caring enough about me coming back to set me on the right path to, to finish with that. And I finished well. And, uh, you know, while I was down there, just as I was finishing, uh, this company was founded in April 96. I finished down there December 96. And in that interim period, uh, they had sent me some product to review. Uh, my father had, had was one of the founding investors of this company, and the management at the time was was trying to sell these products to golfers and into the golf market. And uh, Dad knew I was involved with the uh, University of Alabama Bass Association, which was a, a bass fishing club that was formed for students and faculty and physical plant members at the University of Alabama back in the mid-'90s. And so he sent me products to test and some friends and I started testing them. And, you know, when I graduated, I, he, he asked me, you know, what I thought about it. I said, well, the product's not right for, for fishermen in particular, for outdoorsmen, just because of the way it's made. And he said, well, why don't you come over here and talk to the production and manufacturing people um, up at Kapler, which is the manufacturing group we used in Gunnersville, Alabama, because we were utilizing their fabrics to make our products. So I did, and we designed a little bit better product that would fit more with outdoorsmen and, and started marketing in that direction. And then a, a professional fisherman by the name of Basil Bacon. If you guys are familiar with professional fishing, you'll know Basil Bacon's name. He, sure. uh, 
he he kind of was one of the pioneers of the flipping technique and it was just an overall great person from arkansas and, and we became good friends and he helped us with some design and it was actually basil that took our product to uh, johnny morris at fast pro and convinced mr morris to put this product in his stores uh and start selling and that was our first national account um so from that we we just started expanded once fast pro started selling it just about everybody else in the outdoor space wanted to sell it because they thought they were missing out on something <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would imagine once bass pro picks something up it's kind of a domino effect yeah yeah so and that's that that all happened between 1996 1998 um 1999 through the early 2000s we expanded and, and built some new facilities that i thought you know we built a 10,000 square foot warehouse with attached office space and i thought man this is something to be able to work for a company this size i mean this is i never thought i'd do anything like this you know this and then a year later we built another eighteen thousand square feet adjacent to it i'm like man this is big we're gonna retire from this place here <laughs> this, is, this is the thing i mean we got twenty five thousand square feet of warehouse and three thousand square feet of office and in 2005 we were out of room and had to move to the facility we're in now, which encompassed about, at the time, about 80,000 square feet of warehouse and 10,000 square feet of office. And we've since then added another 60,000 square foot high bay warehouse on this property and are expanding another 180,000 square feet across the road. And that's in process. So it's it's grown quite a bit from a where we started, which was an old doctor's office in downtown Gunnersville. Wow. Goodness gracious. <laughs> wow. What a, what a gratifying yet humbling experience to, to be able to go through that. And I mean, wow. <laughs> I mean, I just can't even imagine. I mean, I know what you mean. You know, sometimes I think we do that even in our personal lives, you know, I mean, I, I came from nothing, you know, and, you know, I remember the first time I made 40,000 one year you know, my wife, I was upset and she goes, what's wrong, babe? As my, I got a raise. And I, I mean, it hit me so hard that I never thought I could, I mean, just, I grew up in a small town and people worked at a factory and you just didn't make over 30, 36,000. You're a blue collar union person, you know? Right. And, uh, and I won't forget when I, that first time it happened, it humbled me to death. You know, and uh, that's what I, I'm just, I'm having all those feelings flush at me thinking about, man, what you guys have done has just got to be incredible. I mean, it is incredible. It, it is. It, uh, yeah. From my perspective, it's, it, it's, um, it's an amazing, amazing blessing just to have been here from the beginning to the point we are now, but it's, you know, the credit for it goes to the employees and the board and the people who have supported it and fought for it and, and who actually make it what it is, you know, I yep. mean, it's a, it's a wonderful brand. It's a, it's a very clean company. I don't think you'll find anything in the, anything or anyone in the market that has anything bad to say about the brand or the products or the people. Um, you know, we, we pride ourselves on putting out the best possible product that we can make. We have very rigorous testing standards. We have very low rates of return compared to competitors in the same markets. Um, we have outstanding customer service. Um, you, you always talk to a live person if you call in with an issue. I mean, you know, it's just things we want to do it the right way every time. And we want people to feel like we want to feel when we contact companies about issues or, or, you know, anything that might be wrong. So, yes, sir. Well, and I have, I've always said this and it's definitely one thing the military taught me and, you know, a great company starts with a great leader and it really, and if you look across every company, I don't care. We just, just observe what you see in your own personal life from restaurants to you name it. Um, it really does start at the top. And so, you know, I know you're going to, you're not going to sit there and say, oh, it's, it was all me. I know, I, I know you're not going to say that Mr. Fowler, but it really starts with that person at the top. And I think it's very rare also for somebody to have a CEO in today's business world that has got the experience like you do with your company. That's super unique. And in, in my opinion, yeah, I mean, again, I, I again, I feel both both very fortunate and very blessed to have been able to spend my entire career with Frog Togs. 
um, just from the aspect of getting to see what it was to what it became. And now with the vision of where it's going and, and what we've got ahead of us, it's, it's still very exciting to work here even after 27 years. I mean, I look forward to every day uh, being here and, and seeing what we can accomplish and what, what, what problems we can solve and, you know, just looking down the road at what's next. I think that that's the best part of my job. And, you know, just getting to interact with people that I, I call my friends, that mm-hmm. they're not just employees. I mean, and, and some of them have been here with long as that they're, they're, they truly are family. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we treat them that way. And, you know, we want to create a very healthy and very positive work environment and ecosystem for these people to perform in. And I think we've accomplished that. It's a wonderful place to work. I mean, there's, you know, there's no bad language. There's no violent people that you don't have. I mean, everybody's secure. Everybody's, you know, firm in where they are. And there's no, there's not a lot of attrition. There's not a lot of turnover. The people that work here are are mostly long-term. Yes, yeah, and and you know, I just recently, you know, being a, a veteran myself, you know, I, it's it's not that you always side with a, a fellow veteran, but whenever you see any veteran, I don't care if it's somebody you just meet on the street, you automatically just feel this connection of brotherhood because this the camaraderie that we share, no matter what branch you're in, even though, you know, us and the Marines like to throw throw trash at each other, and I had an Army guy who one tell me that I wasn't part of the real military you know because i was a navy guy but but i you know i just recently learned that you all are veteran owned and you have several veterans that work there can you talk a little bit about that please yeah so the founding investor my father phil fowler is is an army veteran um vet, um war air vet and uh again started his military career straight out of high school uh when he was 18 years old and, and spent several years in the military and and once he got out of the military, he, he went to school. And once he got out of school, he went to work for the Tennessee Valley Authority as a surveyor, surveying transmission line right away from land between the lakes, Kentucky, all the way down to Pickwick Lake. So mm. um, he, he had quite a few outdoor adventures himself. Um, but he, he finally came back. And once he did that, he, he went to work in an appraisal firm, real estate appraisal firm, started his own business, uh, became very successful with that. Um, and gathered a lot of, of clients that we're doing business with today, hmm. um, you know, through, through that business and then had the opportunity with some of his partners to invest in Frog Togs, among other businesses. But, I mean, he would tell you that Frog Togs was his best decision and his greatest success uh, in business. But, yeah, he, he Army veteran, and then we had uh, our IT guy up until recently, he left for a far better offer that materialized because of his association with our company. So while we hated to lose Jeff, it was a a wonderful opportunity for him and his family. And we were happy that we were instrumental in being able to provide that. And Jeff was an army guy attached to the 20th special forces group. Um, So he was, uh, he got to do some fun stuff during his military career. And again, we've got uh, our operations manager, Kelly Douglas. I told you before is a, is a, uh, uh, prior service marine we affectionately refer to him as the local crayon eater <laughs> <laughs> and then our uh, hr director shannon hicks she's a uh, former navy uh sergeant as well so she she's uh she, she's got a lot of military experience as well and then we have uh several of our board members with prior military experience and there are others in the organization that are uh either active uh national guard uh, Army National Guard, a uh, gentleman across the hall from me just got back from his most recent drill. Um, so we'd still have some active duty uh, guardsmen working for us. So, yeah, we're, we're very proud of that fact as well and, and have always, always been a huge supporter of the armed services uh, and armed forces of the United States. Uh, that's a sometimes a thankless job. And, you know, during Desert Shield, Desert Storm and all that, we were providing the free cooling towels um to uh all the u.s military service that requested them wow that's wow, great that is super cool holy cow wow so i mean i just love that about y'all and you know um and it, you know you've obviously talked about the values of everybody there and and you know just to me i think that is like really what draws you into a brand right i mean so many of us are looking i mean 
like take your t-shirts for example i mean you know you can just go buy any t-shirt but i think whenever you can feel like you can feel the energy of the company that you use and and there's something more to it than that and that's you know american made right here in the united states you know, founded and, and grandfathered up to, to Mr. Fowler running this, this, this business. Can we jump into, I think a lot of people, at least I, myself, I, when the first breathable stuff came out, I was like, all right, I called bull crap on this <laughs> because I'm like, how, like, I'm thinking about it just very simply going, all right, how can air go through it? But water cannot. You know, so to me, topically, I was just like, all right, I got to see if this stuff really works, you know, and, and of course became a believer, but can you talk a little bit about the science behind that and, and you guys innovation in that and, 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 um, kind of dive, dive into that a little bit, just help people understand how that process works. Yeah. So it's, it's a combination of trade secrets and marketing terminology that doesn't really mean anything and <laughs> a, a lot of cool science. But, but let me give you an example. Everybody that's ever been outdoors will understand. Okay. All right. So let's say you're in a barn or a house or a shed or a duck blind with a tin roof. Mm -hmm. And there's a nail hole in that tin roof and it rains two inches in an hour, but no water comes through that hole. Mm hmm. Right? You know what I'm saying? Yep. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a nail hole there and it's raining like crazy, but no water ever comes through that hole. And the answer to that is surface tension. And so a drop of water, guys, if you put a drop of water on your desktop, right, just a drop of water on your desk, it forms a little circle and it's a little dome shaped drop of water, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if you take your finger and you push that water, you can't compress it. No water doesn't compress. So it just spreads out under your finger. And that's so when you move it, I mean, it, you can force water into smaller and smaller and smaller droplets until a point that you can't mm. like a drop of water can only be so small, mm -hmm. right? At the point that you break it down past that, it becomes water vapor molecules of water suspended in air. So as long as your pore in your fabric is smaller than the smallest drop of water under pressure, right? Think about sitting down in a pla hard plastic seat with water in it. Got mm -hmm. it. Right. Most of that water is going to run out, but you're going to have some compression. You know, that water is going to, you know, spread out on your rear end. And if you've got a waterproof suit on there, that pressure's there. And if that pore in that fabric is smaller than what you can make that drop of water become, it can't penetrate. Ah. But yet the, at the molecular level, that water vapor suspended in the atmosphere can pass through it. And the way you can demonstrate that is if you've got a hot cup of coffee in a mirror, you can put our fabric over the hot cup of coffee, hold the mirror over it, and the mirror will still steam up. You can reverse that fabric and pour the coffee in it, and it'll never go through it. Wow. Wow. Holy cow, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's just, so, I, I want to do had, it. <laughs> I've never I've never had somebody um, break it down that way. And that's awesome. Yeah, no. I, I mean, that, that's the quick answer is that it's surface tension. You can only make water become so small. I mean, you know, at some point it's it, it's if you break it down smaller than that, you you break the molecular structure of the drop of water, it becomes water vapor. So, I mean, that that's really the science behind it and then, you know, breathability while it's a real thing, is very, very subjective. And I'm about to make everybody in the waiter and rainwear industry mad, but, I mean, here's the honest truth. So 100%, if you've got a garment that's got 10,000 MVTR, which is moisture vapor transmission rate, and that's kind of right in the middle. You know, you've got zero, which is no breathability. We've got garments that are over 20,000 MVTR, which is extreme breathability. So right in the middle, you got 10,000. Most people can achieve that with, with basic waterproof, breathable fabric. So we'll use that number. So 10,000 MVTR, that's how many micrograms of water can pass through this material in the form of vapor in a 24-hour period in a controlled environment. Mm. And so that's how they measure it. So let me break it down for you. So if you're in the desert with 0% humidity, you have 100% of the breathability capability of your garment working for you mm -hmm. right yep because the atmosphere has zero moisture and it's trying to suck all the moisture that you're producing from inside the garment to the outside air right mm -hmm. right well at 50 percent relative humidity which we all know is not very high you've only got 50 percent of the breathability of that garment 
that's effective because there's already 50% of the moisture that the outside atmosphere can contain is already contained. So it's only trying to pull a little bit of moisture from the inside of your garment to the outside. If you're wearing a breathable garment in the rain, which we know is 100% humidity, how much breathability do you have working for you? Absolutely none yeah. because the water, the air outside the garment's more saturated than the air inside the garment. So, you know, if you're using breathable rainwear, it's a great thing in that it will allow you to dry off if you get wet underneath it over a period of time. But if you're expecting a garment to be breathable when it's surrounded by 100% humidity, that's just sign. It's in the teens that morning, and maybe you're chasing ducks or geese. But now it's September and it's 85 degrees, and you're hunting early teal or geese. As a waterfowler, you need dependable weather protection that will not break the bank. Founded in 1996, Frog Togs is not only the leader in breathable wader technology, but a company you can depend on to keep you warm and dry, head to toe, no matter your hunting environment. Stay bone dry by using discount code ZD315 for 15% off not only your first purchase, like most discount codes, but how about every single purchase you make from now until December 31st, 2024 just does not allow that so that's why i say breathability is kind of a marketing term that, that can be misused the fabric in itself is breathable but the environments we use them in often reduce the effective breathability of those garments to to near or at zero interesting yeah. very interesting that is so so that really blows my mind now i mean so that can be affected by temperature as well because i mean your 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 humidity levels vary by temperature as well. The the, the higher usually the higher humidity and the more um, higher temperatures, you know, whatever. But that yeah. is that is wild. I had no idea. I mean, I knew a little bit about breathability, but now I feel like I just went through a a, a chemistry class or something on breathability. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> not, we won't call it a master's level class in yeah. the science of it, but it, it, it's just logical if you think about it. So if you're in a breathable wader and you're submerged up to your waist, well, from the waist down, the breathability is not helping you because you're you're it's a hundred percent humidity on the outside of the wader. Now, once you get if you're in knee deep water and it's hot, like you say, and you're sweating on the inside, everything above that. As long as the relative humidity outside the garment is lower than the relative humidity on the inside, it's going to allow water vapor to pass through the outside. And like I said, you'll eventually dry off. Uh -huh. And given the fact that breathable fabrics are considerably, considerably lighter than the other options, it, it, it lends to the comfort of breathable waders over other material options as well. Understood. Understood. Now, I mean, I guess I could like throw this at you as a two part question to kind of build off of this. And, you know, I think that anybody that uses a frog talk product across the board i don't care what series what hunting or fishing or whatever the two things that that they do is obviously keep keep you keep you bone dry but secondly the first i mean the second thing i noticed was the wind resistance the wind resistance on y'all's products uh, i mean it, it, it is a significant difference of keeping warm yeah, you're right. And, you know, that happens as a combination. So the, the waterproof breathable film, all of our waterproof and breathability is film based. So there are a lot of coated or treated fabrics out there that say, hey, we got this level of waterproof, this level of breathability, but it's an exterior coating that may eventually wear off. Got we it. don't do any anything that we claim with any level of water resistance or water holdout and breathability is a film-based product, meaning we apply a waterproof breathable film to the shell fabric. And we may also use um, finishes on that product you know, waterproof repellent finishes, but we don't calculate in the water holdout and breathability value. That is specifically, uh, in other words, after 10 washes, this garment's still going to have this level of water holdout, this level of breathability because it's it's engineered into the garment and not a finish on the fabric. Understood. Um, yeah. So you've got uh, you've got those issues, and then the the wind resistance of it. The shell fabric has a lot to do with that. And then the film, again, the, the waterproof breathable film, um, it it negates any wind penetration at almost any speed. So, I mean, if you took our, if you roll your window down in the wintertime, it's 30 degrees outside, and you stick your arm out the window without anything on it, 
I mean, you can hold it out there a minute or two, and then it's going to be very cold because of the wind chill riding down the road. Sure. You can take our our lightest, least expensive product and cover your arm in that fabric, stick it out the same wind, and hold it out there for 30 minutes because you don't experience any of the wind chill effect through the film in that fabric. It's crazy. Uh-huh. I mean, y'all, I mean, I, I, that's, I mean, we have been in fields like, like, remember we hunted those pintails a couple years ago, Tristan? It was like, what was it? It was below zero. It was, I mean, not below zero. I'm sorry, below freezing. Mm-hmm. And we're in wide open rice fields. And I mean, the wind, it was blowing so hard. It was actually fun. It was kind of fun shooting the ducks because whenever they came in, they kind of got stuck, mm-hmm. you know, in front of you, which made it a little bit easier. But I mean, it was howling, man. And we kept getting that little bit of rain, intermittent rain stuff. And I... Dude, we, we were sitting there with our cup of coffee just smiling about how warm we were. <laughs> we we kind of found that it's kind of surprising, like, compared to traditional, like, you know, growing up deer hunting and stuff, like, the amount of layers you'd have to wear based on the coldness, you kind of have an idea of, right? Well, with the frog talk stuff, we kind of are like, we don't have to wear as much under layer no. because it just keeps you that much warmer. It's crazy. Yeah. No, I think you bring up a great point right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, I mean, we definitely wear le- less layers. Like back in the day, mm-hmm. the kind of the rule was whenever you get below, say, comfortable temperature 70. So that's your, that's your t-shirt shorts, right? But every time you step down 10 degrees, you know, from, from 50 degrees down, you add a layer. And it was a stupid system back then. But you know, I've froze my ass off in 40 degree temperatures. You know, I mean, I really have because you didn't dress well yeah. enough. And that's what I think it's it's one of those things where we talk so much about what y'all do against water. Mm-hmm. But y'all, the wind resistance on this stuff is stupid. It's just, it's incredible stuff. No, um, awesome. Um, so, you know, now that we've kind of just talked about the science and understanding some of this stuff, well, um, first and foremost, I want to talk about the Grand Refuge series because th- when we use the waders, the jacket bibs, the jacket waders combo, the jacket bibs combo, um, this is our bread and butter. Yep. I mean, this is like, holy crap, we got to have our Grand Refuge on. It's kind of like, you know, going out of town and forgetting your toothpaste. Yeah. You, you know, you're just like, man. I don't have my toothpaste. Like if I didn't have my grand refuge stuff, I'd probably flip out, <laughs> you know, because we can use this stuff. Y'all just to over before Mr. Will breaks down this, we can use this stuff in teal season, dove season, 90 degree, whatever temperatures down in, on the gulfs of, uh, in the marshes of Florida, South Georgia, we can use the same product at the end of February, wind chill zero, snow geese hunting the exact same outfit Mm -hmm. who who has a product that does that Mm -hmm. that's crazy i mean it really is and and so we're going to dive into this stuff and talk about the grand refuge series it's got a zip in liner um man uh let's just start with the waiters i guess so (coughs) before we even let mr will break this down i'm gonna tell you guys you look cool in them all right (laughs) you do i mean for all you younger guys that you and gals, you know, you want to look good. If you look good, you feel good, right? Just like I used to. All talk. right, all right, Dion. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, I, I know, right? And, you know, and uh, but but you you want to look good, mm-hmm. and it's not some bulky, you know, just weird looking waiter. You look sharp in it, and they give you all these adjustments that you can make it fit you better. Um, but can you just kind of jump into the waiters, Will, and and talk about talk about these three in one, um, the Grand Refuge. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and I, I tell people all the time, I, I don't want to take all the credit with just some. We didn't invent the insulated breathable waiter. We just perfected it, right? So I don't want to take anything away from those other guys out there that, that had an insulated breathable waiter at some time. But, you know, that became popular, what we're talking, seven, eight years ago, probably the first kind of breathable waiter started popping up for hunting. Mm-hmm. They were, you know, basically guys were taking fishing waders and going, you know, it's too hot to wear a neoprene or rubber. I'm going to take my fishing waders and go hunting. And that kind of sparked an idea. And so the first ones that came out were these lightweight, you know, breathable, basically a hunting version of a breathable fishing waiter. And then guys were like, well, yeah, but look, I'm in a neoprene waiter 
with Cordura on it and everything. And the 1600 gram boots weighs 21, 22 pounds for the, for just the waiter. Yep. I mean, if you got to walk around in that all day, it's, it's horrible. So what if we insulate one of these lightweight breathables and we do, and that waiter weighs 11 pounds. It's, it's half the weight of a neoprene waiter, but you get, so that's where, those started hitting the market and, and, you know, we were a fast follower in that regard, had a lot of requests from customers. So we started building a breathable waiter. We already had a lightweight breathable with no insulation. So we started building an insulated breathable. Well, we noticed there was an inherent problem with that. So if you take an insulated breathable waiter and you go stand in the water for an hour and it has a leak, that leak is going to leak through the outer fabric and then it's going to leak through the insulation and it's going to get the person wet. And they're going to return it, and we're going to test it, and we found out some. You cannot test an insulated breathable waiter for leaks because the air pressure on the inside of the waiter, the way we test, push the batting out against the leak and seals it off. Mm. And so you can't identify the leak, therefore you can't repair it. So you're just replacing a you know a waiter that cost you $125, $130 to make. Yeah. And so we were like, okay, so we had a bad batch of them to start with. And so we had half of our employees walking around in waiting pools in the warehouse wearing waiters 30 minutes at a time trying to identify the ones that leaked and the ones that didn't. That's <laughs> hilarious. I would have loved to see a video of that. <laughs> oh, we've got great videos and pictures of it. We don't publish them much because sure. that's one of our embarrassing moments. But the, <laughs> but the point is we went and did what we had to do to find the sellable product, and then we went and did what we had to do to make sure we were making a better product going forward. And so – That developed um, the first patented removable insulation system for a waiter. Mm -hmm. And so we market that today as this three-in-one system where you can go hunt, you know, early season wood duck and goose and teal in North Alabama and Tennessee and Arkansas. Or you can run down to Southern California or Mexico where it's hot, Texas, you know. Laguna Madre, or you can put the liner in it and go up to Manitoba and Northern Canada and, you know, hunt in New York and Illinois and Indiana and all over the refuge stuff in the dead of winter and stand in 35 degree water and green timber all day Mm -hmm. without freezing to death. But the, the actual product development came from the fact that we needed to be able to remove that liner to find leaks to repair those waders. So we'd love to say it was a hunting necessity and we built this waiter so people could do that we built the waiter so we could take the liner out of it and fix them when they needed to be fixed (laughs) well i mean it worked out perfect and you know one thing um i've noticed that you guys just one of the biggest innovations like with the from the grand refuge 2.0 waiter to the 3.0 is um my first pair of uh frog togs waiters my dad had had them the grand refuge 2.0s and then he got me them for my birthday a few years back and um, I wore them for a season and a half, and the only thing that went wrong with them was the way the boots were designed on those 2.0s. I started getting some cracking around the ankles, and I noticed yep. with the 3.0s, you guys improved the boots and actually made a different boot design, and I haven't had that same issue with any of the boots on the 3.0s, and I'm, I'd imagine that's probably just another one of your guys is like, oh, here we go. Let's innovate again, you know? Yeah, they're, they're, they're always evolving when mm-hmm. you – get access to better designs, better materials, better processes. We incorporate those and we constantly work on that. It's not something we just wait to, Oh, Hey, here's an issue we could fix. Yeah. I mean, all our guys are, are, are using these products. We don't have anybody here. That's not an outdoors wonder woman mm-hmm. uh, in some aspect. I mean, some of them are not hunters. They're just pure fishermen. Some of them are big game hunters that don't waterfowl hunt. Some of them are bird hunters, you know, I mean, some of them are hikers, some of them are campers. Um, but, but everybody here has a need for our product in their lives and can make suggestions about, Hey, we did this and, this would actually make this better if we did it this way. And I think that's why our products are so good in comparison to others is that we don't have fashion designers designing products. We have end users designing products. Yeah, that's, Um, that's huge. And so, yeah, you, that, that grand refuge system, it's, yeah, we, we've got the same boot that we're using in our knee boot. You know, our Ridge Buster knee boot is the boot that's on that waiter now. And it's a lower, you know, it's got a little lower um, calf on it. The, the rubber doesn't come up as high. And then you've got, so you got more neoprene uh, and connective area in the breathable 
going into the breathable upper instead of just rubber all the way up. So it's a more comfortable boot to put on and off. It's a more comfortable boot to wear when you're walking around in your waders. If you've got a long hike in or out, um, you know, I, I know most guys are riding side by sides and four wheelers and, I got a pretty quick story about that. We were out with some guys in Arkansas a couple of years ago, and it was a horrible, horrible. I mean, it would have been a two-hour walk from the trucks out to this place we were hunting. And uh, one of the guys said, "Man, I, I mean, what did we do before these four wheelers and side by sides?" And my sales manager looked around the side of the blind. He said, "We hunted like men." <laughs> <laughs> we suffered. <laughs> that's right. That is exactly right. No, that's funny because. In the outdoors, every detail counts. See sharper, aim clearer. From the river's edge to the heart of the flooded timber, Hook and Bullet has your vision covered. Hook and Bullet's purpose-built optics are flawlessly crafted to give you an edge regardless of your outdoor pursuit. Use code ZeroDuck30 for 15% off a pair of Hook and Bullet sunglasses today. You know, that is the truth. You know, I joke around with these younger folks all the time, you know, and I just tell them, I just like... You know, anything from mapping to clothing to, I mean, I've got an original set that uh, I'll never get rid of of, um, back in the day. And I'll talk about that uh, another time. But I've got the original Mossy Oak Breakup Camouflage. It was a single layer that came out. um, And uh, I've only worn it one time. Actually, it's only been worn one one time by my wife because she she only went hunting with me one time my whole life. But, uh, but. You know, looking back on something like that and, you know, you guys probably have stuff that you look back on that you go, wow, has this came a long way. And and I will tell you from a user standpoint, I'll let Tristan say real quick, when y'all came to that new boot, it was, it was a game changer and uh, it really made a big difference. But, you know, one of the things I love about it is, all right, all you hunters out there that are your coastal marsh Florida, Georgia, Carolinas, all the way up the coast. That tide goes in. Now you're stuck. Yep. You, let me tell you what, when you pull this leg of your, of your waders out of three foot of mud, and I am, I'm not lying. Some, sometimes that mud is life threatening. It really is. Y'all, this boot does, you, you don't sit there going, oh crap, my boot's down there. It stays tight against your ankle, which I think is so important from not only that perspective, but then you take the the timber folks in the Midwest and you stand in that timber for three, four hours. And you and this is where we saw a big difference with the Ridge Buster boot in our waders was we were hunting the timber deep water and we had to stand in there for it was cold, man. What was the temperature of the water? 38 degrees or something like yeah. that. And up to our, you know, probably within three, three, four inches of, of our armpits. Mm -hmm. And y'all don't think about the fact that there's water pressure down there. And over time, if if y'all been sitting out there before in the waders that you're using and going, man, my, my calves and my, my ankles and my feet hurt. What that's happened is it's from, from the, from the compression of that water pressure on your boot. And this Ridge Buster boot, you don't feel that, right, Will? That's no, yeah, absolutely, that's correct. There's a, you know, that, that it's all about that ankle fit and that foot room and the, you know, the design of the uh, instep of the boot and, and how it releases. I mean, there's a lot of technical stuff in that, and I mean, I won't say you can't pull your foot out, but that that really snug ankle fit is really paramount to a good boot on those waders. And that's, like I said, that's that third generation boot, that evolution of that boot to get to that point and lowering that rubber upper of the boot down to the ankle. It takes all of that stiffness out above the ankle. So that's what you're talking about as far as pulling your foot out. Mm -hmm. So before you're trying to pull an eight, you know, an 11 inch boot out of the mud. Right now you're trying to pull four inches of boot and you've got all that flexibility above the ankle to the knee so you can wiggle it around. And that's what really helps you there. It's not so much that the boot design doesn't get stuck. It's that you've got so much movement and flexibility and and opportunity to attack it from different angles without that solid boot coming all the way up the calf. 
Yeah, and and then and then you're out there in your your rice fields, your marshes, your mud, and everything. Can you talk a little bit about the track pattern and how that's designed to release the mud? Yeah, it, I mean, it just doesn't know, stick to the, it. The outsole on the boots are, uh, if, if you'll notice, the wrap on them, the way they come up on the sides of the boot instead of just being flat against the bottom with the the foxing the way it used to be. The outsoles now are a little bit wider, and that helps prevent that uh, suction from occurring as you pull up mm. on the boot. It actually lets the air flow around the edges and, and get into the track of the boot and get down into the hole beneath you when you're trying to release from a mud hole. Ah, I got you. I got you. You know, and here's another thing, and, and I don't know that that anybody really talks about this, but this is something that I noticed, and if I'm off on this, just correct me. But you know, Tristan's like, do you know that for a fact? I go, I know when I walk in these waders, it makes a difference. The flap that y'all have about the right above the boot, there's a little flap that comes down. And what I have noticed is when I'm walking in, the, I get into the get into the water, air gets captured in that little flap, right? Will is is that what happens there? It's so that. I, it feels like I have some air trapped in there that I could walk with these boots underwater a little bit easier. I, am I right by that? Yeah, no, it, they, they definitely trap air. And I'd love to say that was a design feature that we thought about, but it's not. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, as soon as you step in, like if you step out of a boat into the water, it's kind of like jumping off a diving board into a pool. I mean, you know, your swim trunks on airtight, but you get an air bubble in them, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And uh, so it's sort of the same concept. While that's not an airtight material, it will trap air and give you a little buoyancy for a short period of time. So, yes, you are absolutely correct that it does trap air and it can make your feet lighter. The deeper the water, the lighter they feel. But it's it's not a design aspect that we, you know, put into practice to say this is going to happen. Um, and, you know, we promote that. But it, it is a cool little feature that, I mean, it's, it's neat that you noticed it. See, that, that's what I was wondering because he was like, he, my dad was like, and I've noticed it too, but I was like, I don't know. Like, I've never seen you guys like promote that. So I was like, I don't know if we should like matter of fact, like, Hey, this is for sure what they do. You know what I mean? But it's funny to hear that perspective from you, Will. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. I, look, we're, we're nothing but brutally honest. If, I, you know, if something was a mistake, I'll tell you it was a mistake. And it turned out to be, you know, one of the greatest inventions in waiter manufacturing in the, in the 21st century you know? <laughs> um, that removable liner nobody really thought about it and it it came as a, a a necessity for our business to be efficient and and provide better customer service that we could remove that liner to test that waiter for leaks and then repair that waiter right mm-hmm. and only after we created it were we like hey you know what we just did y'all <laughs> We just made a till hunter, a till waiter that you can go hunt goose and Canada with. You know, yes. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we've made a, we've made def, we've made a three season waiter. Guy can buy one pair of waiters and have lightweight wood duck till early goose waiters and, and late season, you know, green timber, everything's frozen around me waiters. Yes. No, That's exactly right. that yeah. is exactly right. And here's the other thing too, that I think it's important to point out. And this wasn't on, on our outline really, but you know, from a usability standpoint, so I'll let Will tell you. I'll just I'll just say it with this. I thought when I first got these and these zip, zip in li- waiter liners, I thought, all right, what kind of headache is this going to be? You guys have made this dumb proof. I mean, it's color coded. It happens super easy in and out. Can you talk a little bit about how you how, how you guys designed that? Yeah. Again, we the waiter had to be comfortable. It had to be functional. And for us, it was like, look, if we're going to build these waders, inevitably there's going to be a guy that has, you know, somewhere down the line that's going to have a leak. And we would rather be able to, you know, get that waiter the day he returns it to us, go test it, find the issue, fix it for him, get it back to him. And then if we can't fix it, replace that waiter for him in as timely a manner as possible. Um, That being said, we were like, we just went to our manufacturing partners and like, look, we're already doing this. This is how we need it to function. And honestly, we probably went through five or six samples with different attachment methods and, and all of them work, but none of them were perfect. And then one of our manufacturers said, well, we can just put zippers at the top. I'm like, no, zippers will be uncomfortable and people will know they're there. And he was like, well, you know, little Chinese guys like, well, let me try. 
let me try and make you something. And we were like, okay, go ahead. Dude. Mm-hmm. And so he, he goes to work and he ships us this thing. And he's like, you know, we think we got this for you. Try this out and let us know what you think. And I was like, we all put it on. And we were like, I mean, you can't even tell. Yeah. No, you can't. Super comfortable. So then we took it apart and we were like, yeah, I mean, that we got the liner out of that in like 40 seconds, less than a minute easily, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. And then we went to put it back in and we like put it back in backwards. And I'm like, <laughs> This is not near as comfortable as it was before. So <laughs> I feel like, I mean, I feel like I'm being bound up in the front a little bit. I don't know what I mean. Yeah. And we we're like, well, dang, the thing's in backwards. And we we're like, okay. So then we turned it inside out. And I was, I was like, no, this is never going to work. And that's where the color coded zippers came from. So now if you can put green to green, black to black, orange to orange, you're good to go. Yeah. It's super simple. It really is. And, uh, you were going to say something, Tristan? Nothing. Yeah. No, I was just, it, it's, yeah. it's just simple. It's, 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 it's dummy proof. And you know, it works the same in the bibs. It works the same in the jacket. And you know, um, I don't know if there was there anything else you wanted to share about the waiters, Tristan, before we move on to the jacket? No, I mean, um, like you were talking about earlier, all the ways you can cinch them up and things like that. Um, that really kind of make it make a good difference you know and one of one of the things i love is when you part um pair up the jacket with those waders the um hand the hand pockets on the chest yes that's one of my favorite features because i mean if you're in you know any it doesn't matter what waiter you got if you're in four foot of water i mean or three foot of water or whatever like whatever sort of pockets you have on your waiter you know that kind of stuff's gonna get wet but it's awesome to have that jacket paired with the waiters and keep your hands you know because it I'm not a person that likes to wear gloves, really, and I'll tough it out as cold as I can get it, and have those pockets keep my hands warm and dry or huge. So yeah, no, the, and, and 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 what specifically Tristan's talking about is on the and and again, these guys are using these products, and probably at some point said, "Well, no, we got to put the pockets up there." Mm-hmm. So when you have your waders on, you know how we all just stand there. If you don't have your hands in pockets, you stick them above your waders, and you use your waders and your straps is kind of like armrests, mm-hmm. you don't have to worry about it, that anymore. Number one, it helps rest your arms. Mm-hmm. But number two, you're able to stick your hands in these neoprene pockets. So when you pair that with the waders, mm-hmm. um, it just works together functionally mm-hmm. for sure, you know. But, um, you know, and Tristan and I, a lot of times, the way we wear this stuff is, you know, we, we, we have a rule that, all right, if it's going to be a rainy day, the jacket goes on the outside. Yeah, I made that mistake one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're like, these damn frog talks people don't know what they're doing. And somebody's like, well, you could put the jacket on the outside of the waders. <laughs> no, you you told me. I, I know, yeah, I, I know, I'm, so just being, I'm just being funny. No, I know it wasn't a, a functional issue at all. It was more of a, a common sense issue. And so you take those, uh, you take those... The, those jackets and, and, you know, sometimes you have to put them over the top of your waders cause it's pouring down rain. I mean, it's just the way the, the water flows, you know, but, but it, it works out really great. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So yeah, the only other thing I'd mentioned probably on the wider side before we kick back over is just the evolution of the hardware on them. And that that's to say the buckles, the connections and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, everybody uses, used to use the big, thick molded click together buckles on the shoulders and stuff. But you know, when you mount a shotgun, that's bulky and, and can create issues. So mm. all of the, all of the hardware on our waders now on the chest straps and suspenders and all that sort of thing are all flat. They're all either slide lock or they're, they're hooking, you know, a metal hook, a uh, G buckle yep. style strap for adjustment, but they're all flat. So when you mount a shotgun, there's nothing under there to interfere with how you mount your shotgun. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, I didn't even think about, it. but of course, you know the. I think the two point oh's were like with the those kind of buckles too. You know. So yeah, they yeah. were. Well, yeah, it, and that makes a huge. And it makes it really easy because each side is like one goes one way, one goes the other way. So if if you're sitting there and you're reaching over your back and you're trying to grab it, you can't put it on wrong. Like yeah. the, the way the slide buckles work. It's got to go one way, you know. Right. I don't remember. I don't, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's like a female and a male end. I would call them, and I think that's on your. The strap has the feet male end on the right side, and the female end on the on the right side. But then it's just the opposite on the left side. Yeah, so, they're reversed. So the the incorrect strap can't go to the incorrect buckle. It's only it'll only uh, make with the the buckle that's it, it's intended for. Right, and I mean it's something as simple as that. Just think about if you've ever been around somebody going. I can't get to, and you walk behind them and their, their straps are all twisted and everything else, you know, I mean, it's just something that's just a little perk 
I think, in the design. Well, yeah, and that, and, you know, you were mentioning how they color-coded, you know, the zip and liner, and it's just those little things when, especially if, you know, public land, like, you know, we talk about so many times, like, there's always something that seems to go wrong when you can have the little conveniences. Like, yes. they make they make those, you know, they make your morning a little bit smoother. It keeps you from losing your shit altogether. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For well, sure. look, we, you know, guys, we do this. We, we hunt all season long all over the country with, with you know, our outfitter partners and our guide partners and that sort of thing. And look, we understand the frustrations that arise and, and we're doing it in places that are doing most of the stuff for you. Right. Mm-hmm. So, but, but we grew up doing this. We definitely understand the frustrations that, that come from, from, from every aspect of trying to go waterfowl hunting. And we're trying to take as much of that out of, of your experience with our product as we can, because the last thing you need is a boat that won't start or a dead battery or, you know, frozen decoys that you got, you know, I mean, all that stuff's just part of it. But at the end of the day, you don't need issues with your, your waders and your coats and stuff as well. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, um, I want to jump back to, to one time and I want to uh, just kind of give you guys a, like a real, um, testimony of, of the combination of this stuff, you know, Tristan and I were hunting in Arkansas and that year as two years ago, we swore that we brought rain. Like, like we can't hunt in Arkansas without rain every single weekend, every mm-hmm. single hunt. We're trying to film in it. Everything's breaking down. Just like Will said, <laughs> everything's happening wrong, but we got hammered. I mean, pouring down rain. And it made that hunt everything for us, honestly, because, yeah, we shot some ducks, but the fact that you weren't sitting there just totally soaking wet is just, you, you, uh, you can't beat that. So, um, but when it comes down to the jacket, what y'all are going to find is it's very easy to take in, take out the, um, um, there's some, is that some, is that some background noise or something? I don't know what that is. Um, there was a little bit of background noise. I'm not sure what that was, but anyway, um, no, you can throw a commercial in right then for frog dogs. <laughs> um, but, uh, y'all, so you, you, you want, you want to save some money, right? You don't want to be going out and spending all these different money, all these different jackets and bibs and everything else. If you're going, if you're a serious waterfowl hunter and you're out there, you're going to be goose hunting and you're going to be duck hunting. So you got to have something that works well when you're out there on these dry fields. A true testimony is that we were out snow goose hunting that it was so frozen that there was literally there was no open water at all, and the fields that we were fro- we were on there was 25 mile per hour winds. It was cut beans in the middle of nowhere, and we the Cade tells us. You go. You guys are gonna lay out in the decoys today, and I thought, man, that's gonna be super freaking cold, bro. And it was the first time I wore the bibs and the jacket together. Mm-hmm. And of course, I that day I put the jacket inside the bibs. You know, it just helps with you keeping you warm. And I was just mesmerized. That's when it really hit me about the wind resistance and the the least amount of layers that I had to wear in order to stay warm that day. Yep. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Makes, so, it makes a huge difference. So, all right. So, y'all, we got to dive into us. There's so much more that Frog Dogs brings, y'all. So, and along with the stuff that we use, you know, they also make incredible packs. Uh, they carry an Insights brand that is incredible backpacks, bags. I'm sitting there looking at one right now um, that we just got. It's the XXL. Um the XXL bag. Can you talk a little bit about the insights bags? I mean, because these things are, they look awesome. And we're like so excited to be really using Really innovative them. too. Yeah, very innovative. I mean, water, I wouldn't, I don't know if you, you wouldn't say some, they're not submergible waterproof, but the material y'all, the, the, the material y'all are using and just the way it's designed looks incredible. Can you talk a little bit about the inside backs and the, and the bags? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so Insights was a, a another North Alabama brand that had had uh, developed some some really unique products. Had a lot of innovation, uh, a lot of well thought out. You know, their claim to fame was sort of big game hunting. The uh, they had a, a vision bow pack. You know, that was uh, uh, hands free would carry any any iteration of a longbow or compound bow in the backpack. 
sandwiched, protected, supported, so you could hike in hands free. Yeah, you not have to carry your bow or a separate bow pack, that sort of thing. And it had all the compartments you needed for for scents and extra clothing. I mean, it was a really unique product, and that's what really caught our eye. And, and they were having some issues, you know, with supply chain shortages and that sort of thing. And we were a high volume importer and we felt like there were some synergies. So we approached this company about how we might be able to partner and work together. And as it worked out, the, the best solution was a, a, an acquisition or a merger. And so we took those steps and, and brought that brand under the, uh, the Frog Togs umbrella or the Gunners Will Breathables umbrella and, and, brought over the primary uh, employee um, that was working with them at the time, their, their brand manager and, and business manager. And he's now a frog togs employee, but yeah, those, those bags and packs are, are outstanding. And, you know, you said y'all got the, uh, the XXL, the, the big uh, travel bag. Uh, we call that the body bag. <laughs> yeah. no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you got to have that thing to travel. So, I mean, that's really, you can take, if you're, if you got two guys, going on a, a big, you know, four or five day trip. I mean, that thing will hold two, three pair of waders, mm-hmm. two, three pairs of extra clothes, an additional two, three pairs of boots, you know, um, two blind. I mean, you can stuff all kind of, that's enormous. And then we've got an extra large size, which is a little more practical. Um, but yeah, they're great. And then, you know, we make day packs that, that is not necessarily blind bags, but guys that like a backpack version, it's made in all of the, uh, you know, uh, popular camo patterns and then in a couple of earth tones as well. So we've got those and then we've got packs for saddle hunters, you know, that you can, you can, uh, a pack specifically designed to carry your climbing sticks and, and saddle sling and all that for saddle hunting. Um, for guys that are not using climbing stands anymore, but hunting out of saddles, that's so uh, we've got a pack specifically designed for them. That's really good. But yeah, that bag and pack line, they're, they're really, really premium, high quality, top notch uh, components and, and inputs into that bag. And it, it, it ends up being a really, really nice uh, product. Once you get done, it, it's got some, like I said, it's very innovative. It's well thought out. They're well designed. Um, they're well proportioned. They've got, I mean, they're just really, really nice. If, if you hunt, if you do any kind of hunting, you get one of those immediately upon looking at it in the compartments and how it's designed. You go, hey, these guys knew what they were doing. This is made for guys like me. That's hilarious that you said that because as soon as I opened up, it opened up the box and I pulled it out, I was like, boy, there's some thought put in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the travel bags, you know, one of the things that we've just seen such a, and we haven't even used them yet during a season, but you know, when we're going out to, we live here in North, North Georgia and to get to any sort of duck population for us, it's like minimum four and a half hours, but typically most weekends throughout, you know, November to January, we're going to either Arkansas or Florida Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's seven hours and to have the, the convenience of like uniform, travel gear that our stuff's organized well before you know before this it's just all kinds of totes and you know i i just i'm excited to see how much easier it makes my life this year to have organized travel bags with this stuff like all right waiter bag boom like you know you know check just little check marks again to make your life easier you know you're you're welcome tristan you're welcome (laughs) you're welcome from your 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 ex-military father and 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 these veterans over at frog talks you are welcome they are are some detail oriented people now yeah and and yeah you that the way the reason why you feel that way is because you're yeah you grew up you grew up under me son so (laughs) no but that's the first thing i noticed is i was just like wow dude there's a zipper for this a zipper for that and you put this in you know when do you see this bag, you can use it as a backpack. You can carry it on your shoulder. You can carry it by your hand. It has a over flap that goes over the top of it. So if that's sitting in your back of your truck and it starts raining, your stuff's not going to get all wet. Now you can't go take that bag and throw it under the water. But I mean, we literally looked at the XXL and the XXL and said, dude, these two bags will take everything that yeah. we need on every hunting trip our personal items and everything we need for hunting. That's right. I mean, it's 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 just an incredible combination. So, we're super excited. Um the other thing we're real super excited about is 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 using the new Insights Vision backpack with the bow holder. Mm-hmm. That is super slick. Um 
you know, you're out there walking all that time and you're holding your bow, you're throwing it over your shoulder. The other thing is that you're walking through the woods and some of the most common problems that happen to your bow is because you're walking through the woods and your sight's getting hit by sticks. You're, you get it snagged on a limb and your, your, your string comes off of one of your limbs. Do you want coffee that doesn't suck? Get the duck. Dirty Duck Coffee is made specifically for the waterfowl enthusiast. Enjoy flavors like Morning Wood, Dark Dynasty, Cinnamon Teal Snickerdoodle, and First Flight to unlock the flavor that you'll enjoy in the blind for years to come. Our friends at Dirty Duck Coffee Company are now offering all Zero Duck 30 followers a 15% discount when you use code Zero Duck 15 on your next order. Something like that. You can carry this on your back, keep it it's got a very soft interior, so it's protecting everything in there that you can tightly put it down and easily be walking for. I mean, it's just hands free. It makes it so easy. Yep. yep. Love it. Love it. Love it. Now, Tristan, let's talk about these doggone Java shoes. Mm-hmm. All right. Listen, we've talked a lot about hunting products. And now we're going to start diving into some of the stuff that Frog Dogs also does. That's incredible, y'all. Mm-hmm. And, They've gotten in some of this lifestyle gear stuff, and I'm not going to throw any shade at beep, but I'm going to tell you that right now I'm sitting here. Look at Tristan. Look. Yeah, that's right. You got the Max 7s on. <laughs> I got these Max 7s, Frog Togs, Java shoes, that there's one brand out there that y'all go, oh, why don't you get you a pair of those? No, y'all need to get some of these. Mm-hmm. They are super comfortable. Can you talk a little bit about these casual Java shoes, Will? I mean, these things are awesome. I can, and... Like, like you said, yes, there, there are other brands that, that make similar shoes. But look, it's like I said about the breathable insulated waiter. You know, we didn't make the first one. We made the best one. Yeah. Right. Um, and if you're wearing a pair, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Right? Better outsole, better insole, better price. Um, the version you got is going to be waterproof. What? Oh, wow. <laughs> There's not waterproof. Um, and, and I will say this, you know, from our perspective, w- without without trying to, to put anybody in any position and, and just being honest, there's another brand out there that makes a similar shoe that, that sent letters to its outdoor dealers and said, look, if you sell guns or bullets, you can't carry this product anymore. Wow. You don't fit with our new owner's image of, you know, what we want our brand to be associated with. So, wow. you know, that, that opened a lot of doors for us in the world where we operate because you know what? We love people that sell guns and bullets. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 America. I mean, if you elect not to, that's fine too. We love you too. You're but, right. I mean, you know, I, I don't think that you ought to base how some, how somebody, you know, feeds their family and makes their living you know, against your ideas, unless it's a completely immoral, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Unless just obviously, okay, you can't do that. That's, that's horrible. But, you know, I mean, so, so there were a lot of dealers out there carrying similar products notified that, Hey, because you sell what you sell, we're no longer going to support your business with our products. Good. And so that doesn't change the fact that ours was the better product to begin with, in my opinion. Right. Um, again, better outsole, better insole, more comfortable, um, I, I think they hold up better, yep. um, you know, and, and we've had, we've had great success with that. Um, we, we've got many national retailers and, and, and a, a big, a big, uh, agricultural rural retailer that's got several doors is, is now a customer for that product and has enjoyed great success with it. And look, I, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, we don't spend a ton of money on marketing and, and these slick ads and, you know, reaching out to people and saying, Hey, this is it. I, we build what we build and we sell most of, I mean, we do advertise, but we sell most of it by word of mouth and, and by doing things like this mm-hmm. and by being who we are and, and people that use the products go, Hey, you know what? These guys know what they're doing and they build a really good product and it saves me some money when I buy their product versus somebody else's. And, you know, I'm, I'm taken care of if I have a problem. Well, I just think it's super cool that I've known Frog Talk so much from a hunting perspective that, you know, Tristan got these these white Java shoes and he put them on the other day, he was getting ready to go out with his wife, you know, and everything. He's going to a Braves game. Going to a Braves game. And he sent me a picture of them and I was like, damn, dude, those things look they they look tight. They well, look good. I'm I'm a big <laughs> I'm a big white shoes guy. And uh <laughs> 
other brands we won't talk about. It was the last pair of white shoes I had. Yeah. And uh, when I saw those Java shoes, I'm like, oh yeah, I got to get those in white. And they're they're slick, man. They they, they are slick. they are super super cool product. But you know, while we're talking about footwear a little bit, um, you know, there's also you know y'all they have the Ridge Buster boot. Um, which is an incredible, we, that's our, our number one go-to boot. I mean, we wear that day in, day out. Um, but now you guys will, and we were going to talk about some newer products later, but I think it just applies now. Y'all have made a lightweight Ridge Buster boot and an ankle Ridge Buster boot now, right? That's correct. Yeah. The, the ankle, the ankle Ridge Buster boots, my favorite shoe that we make bar none. Oh, I'm getting that thing immediately. I just saw it. it. it, it, (laughs) It's ankle high. It's waterproof. It's got an aggressive outsole, you know, like an outdoor boot has. Mm-hmm. It, it to me, it is the. It's got that tight ankle fit. You know, it's not open like the deck boots are at yep. the top, which is a lot of people love that. But for me, for a chore boot, that thing's got to fit like an athletic shoe, right? I don't right. want it slopping around and slipping. I mean, if I'm out there running a weed eater or a saw or just, you know, I, I want I want it to fit so I so it's stable and I'm I'm comfortable that I'm not gonna you know pull a foot out of it or something like that. So I love that snug ankle fit. It's still I, I can still put them on and off without using my hands, but I can still push my foot down in it, get my heel inside, it, push my foot down without collapsing. It's still easy to put on and off, but that thing fits just perfect. I mean, you get a lace up type fit with a slip on boot that is literally ankle high, so you can wear it all summer doing chores and gardening. I mean, I wear it in the wintertime. It's my fishing shoe, right, with yep. my I'm, – I'm wearing the Grand Refuge um, insulated liners under my FTX Elite rain suit, and that is my go-to shoe, and it's warm down to, you know, 20 degrees. But it's still – it's light enough in the summertime. I can get out there, and it's short enough that, I mean, you know, I can get out there and work, and it's still comfortable. Wow. I, I, I'm excited to put my foot in a, set, a pair of those because and, – and here's the thing. I just – this just hit me. It's like y'all are always one step ahead and you keep surprising us, right? So, you know, Tristan talked about the boot innovation, um, you know, with the, with the Ridge Buster boot. And now, you know, the thing is with these is last year we, we were on a muddy goose hunt and we had on our Frog Togs deck boots, you know, and which are incredibly great for fishing. I mean, they're awesome. But, you know, one thing that we honestly said was, Man, oh, you know, it'd be kind of cool if they had something that was a little bit that held on a little bit better and did a little bit better in the mud. And I'll be son of a gun. You guys come out with this stuff this year, and we're just like gold. We need that. Yeah, yeah deck shoe's awesome, but it is what it is. It's like yeah. deck shoe. It's a flat, non-marking, non-slip sole to be used on you know wet wooden piers and wet fiberglass and around boats and docks and things like that. So sure. I mean that that's where it comes into play. Yeah, if you get that thing out in the mud, you're gonna be sliding around like Michael Jackson. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were trying to use something that wasn't built for that purpose. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Um, so. Here's the, here's the thing, and it really kind of builds up this, you know, we, in this podcast show, we, you know, we're not just, just hunters, you know, we cover everything outdoors, you know, and we've had some incredible fishing guests on, you know, Shiloh, uh, one of the leading crappie fishermen in, in the United States, up and comers, you know, and uh, some, some other great guests. Y'all's fishing line of stuff you do is just incredible and i'm just gonna let you steal the show here if you don't mind will and talk about you guys incredible fishing products and why you guys have became so big in the fishing industry well i mean you know our our roots with this product are in fit in bass fishing i mean again it was a, a professional bass on or basal bacon it was bass pro shops it was our first national account i mean th- i mean those were you know our our people and, and let me say this i mean this company when it was founded the mission statement was keeping common folks comfortable during their outdoor pursuits hmm. right i mean that was the goal of this company was to provide products that made you made you more comfortable made you perform better you know doing whatever you did outdoors um but the bass fishing roots run deep here um you know kevin our sales manager now, now his kids are of an age. He's almost got his last one out of high school. He'll be back to the, the fishing grounds with us. But I went through <laughs> the same stage with mine. But but we grew up tournament bass fishing 
with each other and against each other here in North Alabama on Lake Gunnersville. And, oh, yeah. you know, um, we were both competitive anglers back in our heyday here. Um, we won our share and, and, and took home, you know, we hurt some feelings from time to time taking money, but, <laughs> um, you know, that those days are kind of behind me. I still fish a few tournaments, but it's, it's just for fun. We're not real serious with it anymore. We do some fun fishing quite a bit, but so the, the fishing side of it for me has always been a huge part of what we do just because it's always been a huge market for us is is that angler. And I think we've built products that appeal to a broad range of angler. And that could be a granddad taking his grandson that doesn't go much down to the, you know, the local city park to fish and, you know, stopping at Walmart and grabbing a couple of rain suits or ponchos for them in case it rains Mm -hmm. out to the guy that's, literally guiding 300 days a year and it doesn't matter what the weather is and he wants gear that's going to work and he's using our ftx elite set that that all of our pros and influence are using now so from the rainwear side of things you know i I think fishing all aspects and every kind of fishing we make a great great outerwear product for anglers of, of any size, style, you know, men, women, children, all of that we cover in that. I think that's wonderful. From the footwear perspective, the deck boot, um, the new Hydro Grip, uh, athletic boat shoe. I'm wearing a pair right now, and guys, they're hitting the market this spring, and they are absolutely phenomenal. Nice. I mean, it's like the most comfortable sneaker or tennis shoe you've ever put on combined with a non-slip boat grip. And, and a slip on design, it, it's they're they're amazing. I mean, it may be my new favorite above the uh, Ridge Buster Light, but I hadn't worn them quite enough yet to make that determination. But it's going to be very close. So that and the flip flops. I mean, how how many people fishing flip flops? I've never worn flip flops till we started making them because I didn't like them. <laughs> but, but we build some absolutely phenomenal flip flops. I will say I'm a flip flop guy now, and we make some great slides and sandals as well. So all of that from a fishing perspective, I mean, footwear-wise, I'd say we've probably got one of the best collections of footwear for anything from guides and and charter captains in saltwater to, you know, bank fishermen in freshwater. Um, And so that's rainwear and footwear. Then we've got a great selection of headwear as well. We've got sun hats. You know, we've got uh, net gaiters, sun protective scarves and face covers. Um, We've got gloves coming, you know, SPF fingerless gloves and finger gloves coming we make a great winter fishing glove it's a real thin neoprene on the back with uh, a real thin facing on the front and conductive thread so you can use your touch screen devices without taking your gloves off um little details like that and then you know we've got the tackle organization and tackle storage where mm. we make the tackle boxes and the tackle totes the tackle trays the new tackle vault that debuted at icast um so you know the tackle storage and organization side of, of that business is huge as well you've got tackle backpacks sling packs you've got coastal wading products um for guys that are wade fishing either trout uh stream wading or uh saltwater stream wading they got sling packs for tackle boxes and fly trays i mean it's it's a very extensive line of products designed for fishermen as far as tackle storage and organization and the new tackle vault that, that's coming this spring is going to be a really really cool piece to that it is uh, an injection molded outside container that'll take either 3600 or 3700 size trays um, with a shoulder strap and then it's got a molly attachment system where you can attach different um, accessories to it such as knife sheath plier holders uh rod holders, line spoolers, all that kind of thing. So for your shorebound, boat hopping, pier type angler, um, mobile angler, that's going to be a, a really cool little item. Yeah, I would imagine just um, kind of just looking at this like topically, you know, from fishing, you know, there's so many different environments. I mean, you could have a, here in North Georgia or Montana or something, you could have a fly fisherman that's, you know, like you said, kind of on the go or, you know, that kind of style, or you can have a deep sea fisherman or, you know, there's just so many different, you have somebody on the river in a kayak or ocean in a kayak. There's so many different, um, spinoffs of fishing to how, you know, you can get into catching fish versus like duck hunting. It's like, all right, there's a certain amount of environments, but 
you still need a blind bag. You still need these essentials, you know, and deer hunting. You still need to get your bow to the tree stand. Like, there's not as many variables, I feel like, with hunting as there is with fishing, you know? Well, and I think that in the, to piggyback up on something that we talked about earlier, it's, again, about making that fisherman's life easier, mm-hmm. you know, and especially the professional. You're out there professionally fishing, you know, I mean, I don't even know what that level's like, but I would imagine that, you know, you've got six colors of this one lure and you want to be able to get in there and grab that thing as quick as you can because you need to make that switch or whatever and you need to do it in an organized fashion. Mm-hmm. You know, and also you could just kind of look badass, honestly. If, <laughs> if you if you have, like, uh, I'm just this ex-military guy and I'm thinking about I me mean, having like 400 lures or something and I'm able to like, oh, there they are all together. They're all color-coded and they are, everything's just organized and easy to get to. Mm-hmm. Right. That's awesome, man. That is awesome. So, you know, when it comes to um, a lot of these products, you know, especially from a waiter perspective for us, uh, us waterfowl hunters, and when it comes to fishermen, let's talk a little bit because I heard you talking a little bit with Dennis and Billy over there uh, about your warranty process and what you're going to be doing with that, um, with your waiters and stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that, Will? Sure. So, yeah, happy to, and I think that's a big part of what we do and a huge part of our customer service program when it comes to waiters and, and turnaround on repairs and replacements. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when we build waiters at our factories, we, I think we have, and I can't speak to what other people do, I can only speak to the results that we see and what we hear from our retailers, but we have very extensive submersion testing procedures. Mm -hmm. Um, not just once, but some multiple times for each pair of waders that we produce. And that's to ensure that when the waiter gets here, it's not leaking out of the box, that we haven't just sold somebody something that's not going to work. Because there's nothing worse than getting a brand new pair of waders and having issues with them, right? Right. Um, So we, we have a very, very extensive and meticulous process for testing at the factory level. And then we also pull random samples from production when they arrive and test those here as well. We have the same sort of submersion testing set up as they do, which is very intricate. Um, And, you know, I really can't describe it because it's a little bit of a trade secret how we do that. Sure. But if you have an issue with a waiter and you say, hey, look, I bought these waiters and, you know, I've had them a while, but now they're leaking or there's some kind. We can take that waiter and the information from the customer and we could submerge and test that, that waiter. We can identify the leaks through positive pressure, and then we can repair that waiter and send it back to the customer, and that's a very short turnaround. Or we can identify that the waiter can't be repaired with our methods, and we can replace that waiter in a very short time period. Um, and, and even when we get waiters back that are out of warranty, if we can repair them, we do that at no charge. Mm. Um You know, and then if we can't repair them and they're out of warranty, we do try to do something nice like a gift card or a discount card or something like that for the consumer. Um, You know, even if it's their fault, the damage is their fault, we we still want them to be a customer. We we try to do the right thing and, and, and be a good partner for them. Nice. And didn't, and didn't you mention with when you were talking to, with Billy and Dennis, you were talking about the retailers actually have this submersion testing available there so that it can be like more quickly resolved, right? That's correct. We have provided high volume retailers with submersion testing equipment, just like the one we use, um, so that there is a quick return around for the customer. And those waiters could be tested potentially even while the customer's waiting, depending on you know the, the service level of that particular store and, and what their customer count is at that moment. But yeah, I, we, we provided that. And, and, of course, they use that not only for our products, but for competitive products as well. And I think that just goes to the customer service of the store. And we don't, you know, we would never say, hey, you can't taste other people's waiters on our equipment. That's just ridiculous. Right. I mean, it, it's an opportunity for that store to provide a level of customer service that customer might not be able to receive elsewhere. And so, you know, we're happy to provide that for them. Um, it, 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 it creates a happier customer for us. Hopefully it creates a happier customer for the competitor and it certainly creates a happier customer for that store. Sure. No, no doubt about it. And, you know, I think that, you know, I'm on the side of the fence that when it comes to warranty issues, that so many 
So much is within our control. Eli. Our partners at HuntWise are offering an exclusive discount for Zero Duck 30 followers. As an elite member, some of the features you'll immediately gain access to are HuntCast, WindCast, Peak Kill Times, Property Lines, Owner Information and Phone Lookup, 250 map layers, unlimited offline maps, 3D maps, social media, and on top of it all, save up to 50% on some of the top hunting brands in the industry. Download and explore the number one hunting tool set today and save 20% by using code DUCK30. Like when it comes to like, you know, if you got your vehicle and, and your dad says, make sure you get that oil changed so many thousand miles or whatever, proper care and handling. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and the proper care and handling that, that you guys recommend to consumers, you know, um, whether it be washing it or, or taking care of it? Yeah, you know, the, the biggest thing I could say about that, whether it's rainwear or waders or insulated gear or anything that you put on and take off, my advice would be hang it up on a clothes hanger. Don't fold it up, stick it in a closet. Don't shove it down a compartment in your boat and expect it. I mean, it's, it's just not, I mean, look at it from this perspective. If you went and want to, bought a, an $800 Armani suit, you wouldn't go home, take it off, throw it in the corner of the closet, and then be mad when you went to put it on six months later and it's wrinkled. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, don't don't buy a six or $700 rain suit, shove it in the live well of your boat or in the storage compartment of your boat, wet, close the lid, leave it in there for three weeks, come back and get mad when it's mildew and moldy. Right. 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 Same thing with your waiters. Don't take off a pair of waiters, wad them up, throw them in the back corner of your truck. And then, I mean, they're not going to last like that. They're, right. they're high performance fabrics. They're tough and they're durable, but they're, they're not meant to be treated that way. So my, the biggest thing from my perspective is, you know what, you use the heel kicks on the boots or use a boot puller to, to take your boots off. You know, if you're getting out of your waiter, don't leave them inside out, you know, Fold them right side out. Hang, if you got the opportunity, hang them up or at least hang them over something, right? So they're not wadded up. That's that's the biggest advice that you can give anybody with rain wearing waders is hang them up. Don't fold them up. Don't wad them up. Don't shove them in the corner. Make sure they're clean and dry. I mean, spray them off the water, hang them up, let them drip dry. I mean, that would go a long way just to getting, you know, if you let mud get in breathable fabric and then you let that mud dry, it's just like sandpaper in there. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's going to destroy your waterproof membrane as it works through that outer layer of fabric and gets in there, and it's going to create all kinds of problems for you. I mean, you know, grit is it just doesn't work. I mean, so it, just take care of them, clean them up. Yeah, I mean, most of your rainwear can be machine washed, but it needs to be drip dried. And occasionally you're going to have to replace the, the durable waterproof repellent on the outside with a camp dryer or a silicon spray. And that doesn't do anything to the waterproofness, but it keeps that outside fabric from wetting out which is going to add weight to the garment and make it feel clammy on the inside, even though you're dry. So there's, yeah, there's some tips and things you can do. And we've published a lot of that on our website, but the biggest tip from my perspective is, man, spray them off. Don't leave them dirty. Don't leave them dirty. Don't let them dry with dirt on. Yeah. Hose them off with a garden hose, whatever you got to do. And then, and hang them up, hang them by the straps or hang them up by the boots or, you know, fold them in half over something, but don't, you know, don't wad them up or just, you know, I mean, I see it. I did it all my life, right? I mean, right. end of the season, kick your waders off, kick them over in the corner of the garage, and then next year you go hunting and they leak, and you wonder why. Well, I mean, maybe if I'd have hung them up, they'd have, you know, most of my problem was rats chewing holes in them or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. No, but it really just, just take that into consideration when you're expecting the most out of, out of a product is that, you know, y'all, y'all, we all have to take care of them. And, and that's the bottom line. Um, so you guys, you can go online to buy frog dogs products, um, which I will say I am like an internet navigation website navigation freak. I hate it when a company doesn't make it easy for me to buy what I want right now. You know, then we're in, in that type of society. We're like I want it and I want it now. You can go onto the frog dogs website and, and y'all it's so easy. Man, woman, footwear, waiters, fishermen, whatever you are to click on what you want to click and get to what you want so quickly and easy. There's great product descriptions on every single product that's there, but 
Y'all, you can also go and buy these products at, at several manufacturers, I mean, several uh, dealers, right? Oh, yeah. From, from a waterfowl perspective, I'd say just the, almost every well known waterfowl retailer in the United States is going to have a, a pretty significant selection of, of frog togs, waders, probably boots and shoes. And potentially even, you know, rainwear and, and insulated items. So, but waiters for sure. If, if they're a waterfowl company and they don't have an exclusive agreement with some other provider, then yes, you would be able to buy frog togs waiters from just about any of those. That's awesome. So, you know, so you have two options. You can either be the internet person or you're like, no, I have to, like us older folks, you're like, I want to go buy that. I want to feel it, see it before it comes. You just like this whole buying craze of buying a car without being able to drive it. I'm just like, who are these people? Because I'm not that person. I well, have there's some merit in that, guys. You know, I mean, even, let's just take our Grand Refuge line, right? So Grand Refuge, you can buy slim, regular, and husky sizes in every boot size. And then those are adjustable beyond that. At my size, I know I'm in a husky to be comfortable, and I'm – I'm in a regular if I want to look like a can of biscuits. It's just been rough. <laughs> um, but there's no way I'm getting in a slim, right. you know. But now there might be a guy that goes, well, I don't know if I'm slim or if I'm regular that may need to go to a store just to do that. We offer really uh, in-depth sizing charts, and obviously you can call if you have questions about that. But, but I mean, typically you know whether you're a slim or regular or a husky, right? Yeah. So, But we offer that, and, you know, I'm – Boot sizes for women and children, um, you know, we, we've got the Grand Refuge Junior, which is perfect for the ladies and the, the younger hunters, and then the Grand Refuge 3.0. The I mean, we've got all kind of high-end uh, hunting waders with all kind of different features. If you want a zip front waiter, we've got that as well. Yep. Um, you know, that's a great waiter if you're standing in timber for a long period of time, and I think the, 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 the pros of that, product so to speak for themselves i mean you can unzip the front of it so we know what that's for yeah yeah you guys and and we can't jump out of here without talking about and we talked about a little bit with will before we got on on and on the podcast is y'all they just came out with a brand new grand refuge 3.0 bf zip front waiter that it doesn't have the zip zip liner it's a lightweight and I was saying on the product review that we were, we were we were recording Tristan about how versatile it is, where you can buy one set of boots or one set of waders, and you can be a fisherman or hunter mm-hmm. in one set of waders. Period. And Will, would you talk a little bit about the uh, about you guys coming out with that? We're excited. Yeah. So we, you know, we we built off the the Grand Refuge three several years ago and introduced the steel header. Uh, insulated fishing waiter that, that was basically the hunting waiter in solid colors for fishermen. Um, but the new, you know, the new 2RZ, which is the Ben's Grand View 3 3.0 zip front waiter, um, yeah, it, it's just a multi climate breathable chest waiter. It, it's it's got those G buckle uh, suspension uh, straps I was talking about earlier. Yep. Um, where you just got the G shaped metal hook and you just pick a, a slot to put it in mm-hmm. really quick and easy. Um, but it's, it's got all the cool features you expect, but it is in that, you know, it's in that autumn brown color. Yep. And so guys that, you know, may hunt different terrain from rice fields to pits, to timber, to, you know, hardwoods, to streams, ponds, that sort of thing. It's just that neutral, you know, dirt brown kind of fall brown color that you can use in any of those situations mm-hmm. um, without having a camo pattern that that really contrasts with your surroundings. So we made that in a solid brown. We offer the Grand Refuge 3.0 in that new brown color as well. But, yeah, that zip front waiter is, is just so – ultimately, it's just so convenient, um, I, you know, it, that it, it's just worth the price to have that zipper in the front, which that zipper is what increases the price of it. That zipper is very expensive. But at the end of the day, guys, if you're standing out there in, in almost waist-deep water in green timber in Arkansas and you've been there for three hours and that coffee's hitting you, <laughs> having the ability not to have to take your coat off your shoulders or hang it on a tree to take care of that, 
is, I mean, you can't put a price on that. No, right. I totally agree. You know, we've all been there. We, we, we have, no, it's, it's a sharp looking product and you guys will find the same Ridge Buster boot on that thing. You're going to find the same fit and adjustability as you find on the regular gray and refuge. And it's, the pockets that we were talking about in the jacket before they have the pockets, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so and you got extra pockets actually mm -hmm. in these new ones, which are really cool. The zip front pockets that I'm excited about. So yeah, we will be putting a product review out on this, you guys. And it, it, it's very cool. Very cool product. Um, you guys have to check that out. So we're not going to get out of here without talking about the highlights of one of Tristan and I's biggest things that's happened this year outside of hunting was crappie fishing for big crappie. I hear that you are, maybe we need to have you on as a crappie pro. <laughs> oh, no. I, I heard that's your love. I heard you love it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to come on as a pro and embarrass all those other guys that call themselves pros. So <laughs> we, we, can just, we can just call me an enthusiast. There you go. <laughs> now, I heard you love it a little bit, Will. Well, it has, uh, it, you know, that stuff's kind of addicting, honestly. I mean, and, and at my age, I'm, I'm getting a little long in the tooth, a little gray on the temples there, you know. If I, yep. My wife would say a lot of gray on the temples. <laughs> but, you know, I, I still love the waterfowl hunt, but I've noticed, you know, I haven't hooked the boat up at 5 in the morning and go to a crappie hole and either have a one-man limit or determine they're not biting by about the time that shooting time starts anyway <laughs> and, and be back at the house before the guns start going boom. And <laughs> so that's a, that's a big draw for me. Yeah. Um, and it's close to home. You know, I don't have to travel to do it. Gunners of Lakes, one of the best crappie fishing lakes in the entire world, in my opinion. Um, and, and look, I, I'm, I'm really not that good at it. I, I've had a lot of people who are really good at it teach me some things and show me how to do it. And so I'm very grateful to them because it, it is a, a big part of, of my outdoor experience is crappie fishing. It's one of my favorite things to do. And it's one of those things, and this is the biggest, it's one of those things that's easy to share with other people because it's not hard to do. Yeah. I can take guys that don't get to fish often and they can go have a great experience catching a lot of fish, harvesting some if they want to, to share with their friends and family. I can take young people to do it. I can take old people to do it that may not have dexterity to to bass fish or stay in the boat all day. So it's a really wonderful opportunity for me to share not only my passion for the outdoors, but to share in some fellowship with people that might not otherwise get to experience that and have a really good time and enjoy enjoyable experience doing it. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, we just, we we experience how addictive it is. And, you know, we always are humbled by the fact that we grew up in Illinois. We're from the land of the giant deer. But when we got to experience the land of the giant crappie, uh, we went out to Lake Arkabutla this year and uh, post-spawn, and we were just blown away. Uh, I had never trolled for anything outside. I mean, like at this kind of level, outside of like offshore fishing. We had right. these, these boys had eight poles going. They had depth clickers. They had bass lures on these oh, yeah. crankbaits. And we were like, what in the, I mean, it was just incredible to fish that way. And I, now I understand the addiction. <laughs> yeah. We don't troll here. I mean, we, we have guys that do, but you know, we have eel grass on the lake and it floats and it fouls trolling lines pretty often. We're, what we're doing, you know, starting, actually starting pretty soon is that the crop will start grouping up on Creek channel bins, brush piles and stumps. And in the winter, those schools can be 1,000, 2,000 fish at times and, wow. and start getting on bridge pilings. And so we're just pitching jigs to them. Gotcha. You guys live scoping? We are. Yep. Um, once you find them, it, it's it's not it's not like the tournament guys that are saying, oh, here's a specific fish I'm going to drop down and catch. We're looking at them on live scope to, to gauge the school's reaction to your presentation. Does it need to be vertical? Does it need to drop into them? Does it need to be above them? So we're using live scope as a tool to determine the mood of the crappie more so than identify targets. I got you. I got gotcha. you. So on that note, what is your favorite fishing story? Oh you my gosh. I, you know, probably my favorite, I, well, it's bittersweet. I mean, I, I'm sure I deserved it. But the day I caught my very first bass, um, I was, uh, I don't remember what I'd been, 
what I had done, but I got in a lot of trouble and I got my butt torn up. <laughs> and I, I was I was feeling some kind of way about that. I guess I was a little sensitive and, and my feelings were really hurt. And I was, you know, I was anyway, after after a few hours, dad came and said, well, I'm going to go down here to the neighbor's lake and go fishing. Get your rod. You can go with me. And it started raining on the way down there. And so we had an old 1972 Chevrolet pickup truck with a uh, camper shell on it. So we had raised the the lid on the camper shell and set the tailgate down and just backed up to the pond when it quit raining. And I had a, I don't even remember what lure it was, some kind of little topwater lure. And I was just tossing it out there around the bank and uh, from the back of the truck. And I caught my first bass doing that. And I just remember Dad saying, he said, well, there you go. I said, well, that's my first ever bass. And he was like, you know, well, bless your heart. <laughs> you know, uh, so that that's one that sticks out. And then, you know, another one that's close to that is, is dad and I had gone camping at this same farm and had fished around out of the canoe all day and, and caught a few fish for supper. But as the uh, sun went down, the moon came up, the, the cattle had waded in and there was a big clearing in the, the mill foil in this lake mm. where the cattle had waded in. and we were throwing little rubber frogs, you know, the hollow body frogs back then. They were only made in this area around Gunnersville. We were throwing those on the grass and pulling them in. And we caught a bass every cast for probably two hours. Goodness gracious. So that, that was both of those in the same place about the same time period. But those really stand out to me. I've, I've got hundreds of them. I could sit here for the next three hours and talk about fishing. <laughs> I remember my daughter's first fish. I remember my son's first fish. I remember my first saltwater fish, their first saltwater fish. You know, I mean, my first redfish. First, I, so all of those are are standouts, and I'm I'm appreciative of all of them. But I, those were two of my earliest and are are real standouts. Well, you know, Will, we got it. I want to I want to stay on here with you all day. But you know, the the thing is, that we want to be respectful of your time. We've definitely. Uh, dug a little little further and deeper than than what we expected and we certainly appreciate you extending your time to us and, and everybody that's listening right now because i think it just shows again when you buy a product from frog togs i mean we we're humbled to death that the ceo just sat here and, and spent uh, over an hour and a half with us on on this show on a friday and we know you're busy and Man, we thank you so much for taking the time um, to to talk with us and 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 our listeners to get a, a full in depth view of who Frog Togs is and what they're all about. Thank you so much, and thank you for everything y'all do to help support us. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Well, again, guys, it, honestly, it was my pleasure, and and you know, to the people in the audience that are our customers and that will be our customers in the future, you know they're the ones that really make us what we are. So we can't say thank you enough to them. And we hope that what we provide is, is something that they will treasure the way that we, we treasure making it for them and, and that it serves them well. And, and that when they do become a customer that they know they're part of the family, just like the people that work here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, man. And y'all, if you guys get a chance, jump on frogtogs.com, check out all their new products. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions about any of their products, functionalities, and maybe something we didn't talk about today, y'all know that Tristan and I always get back to folks. And you yeah. guys can reach out to us, and we'll be right there. And if we don't know the answer, you know, there's these great folks at Frog Togs that help us get the answer for you. That's right. Tristan, you got anything else to add? No, just, uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Will. It's It's been great and uh, opened our eyes to some cool things that we didn't know inside and out. And um, just love love working with you guys and um, excited to, you know, share some of these product reviews and some of the cool stuff we got coming out. Well, hopefully we get to do this together, uh, again, together pretty soon. So anytime you guys want to talk about stuff, give me a call. We'll jump on and talk about it. And if y'all want to do a a crappie thing then i think we should probably do that from the boat down here yes sir That'd no uh, you you give us time and date and we'll make our wives mad and we'll be there <laughs> 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 yes sir i've been southbound i've been hellbound riding on the midnight train going too fast now think i'll slow down standing in the pouring rain 